This week on the show, Fnatic take the ESL Barcelona title, Tempo Storm, Liquid and CLG punch tickets to DreamHack Malma, and cloud Nine struggles continue. I'm Jack Westerman, joined by Jason Moses O'Toole, and you're watching Pop Flash. This week's clip is Evil Geniuses vs Redcode at IEM5 2011, where nothing picks up an ace in a big Group B win. Unfortunately, this was the only match Evil Geniuses won at IEM. They finished joint bottom of their group, while Na'Vi took home the title. Our first story this week is ESL Barcelona, which took place in Barcelona, Spain, between February 19th and 21st. Now, $75,000 up for grab, and Jason, you were there on site. What do you feel, what are your thoughts about Barcelona? Uh, it was cool. Uh, it seemed like a really nice city. We didn't have too much time to go exploring, but a lot of fans came out. Um, beautiful weather, the beaches, the women. It was all great. Yeah, the women really hit the beach. The counter strike, aren't they? The counter strike was good as well. <laughs> all right. Well, speaking of the event, so this is uh, a slightly weird format. This is one of those events where uh, you have lives, right? So each team starts with three lives, and each loss uh, the team gets is minus one life. So uh, when a team reaches zero lives that's the end of their tournament essentially and as we have a look at the final standings uh, we can see that all of those teams lost their lives apart from Fnatic who obviously won the whole thing uh, now you might look at this order Jason and think well it kind of makes sense Fnatic at the top the two unknown Spanish teams down the bottom uh, and everybody in the middle is kind of in the right place you might argue however how do you feel about this tournament format overall are you in love with the lives concept uh, I think it can use some tweaking. I, I think it's a really fun event, to be honest with you, uh, especially because the players get so into it, the teams with their alliances get really into it. I think without that, uh, it, it's kind of like a stale, it would be a stale format. But I mean, it, let, let's be honest, this isn't a tournament that's going to influence our thoughts on, you know, world ranking so much because you do have that added aspect of those alliances, of the politics behind it. Um, as you can see by, you know, for instance, Envy getting fifth place below G2 and Dignitas based fully on the fact that G2 established an alliance with them and Fnatic and then and then backstabbed them, which was sweet, which was like awesome for that, for just the excitement and the fun of the event. Um, oh, yeah. But I mean, that's, that's kind of what caused you you think envy is good. definitely envy would place higher uh, if they hadn't you know done the the, the traitorous dog trick yeah of course well uh, envy did finish in uh, first place in fact they won the whole event last time this happened last year right but we'll we'll come back and talk about them so uh, the first two teams i want to talk about in this this standings i guess are the two spanish teams down the bottom uh, and you know spanish women might be fine but g bots and existence really weren't fine this tournament i think they went uh, combined well, the, well, Existence won seven rounds across three maps, yeah. which uh, is, is not a great start to any tournament. No. And uh, four of the five players were in the statistically, uh, well, statistically the worst of the whole tournament. Any thoughts on the Spaniards as Counter-Strike players, Jason? Uh, G-Bots actually looked uh, pretty impressive. I mean, they had, they had, they had, they had those close losses to Dignitas, 14-16, yeah. Fnatic 13-16. They did lose 4-16 to to Envy. Um, but those, I mean, initially, you, you can see they have some of the skills required to, to compete. Um, I mean, they're not they're not world beaters as individual players, but you know, tactically they have to catch up. But essentially, this is just experience for all those guys. This Gbots team, from what I was told and from what I've read, that's a lineup that just got together about a month ago. Like Existence was supposed to be the better team, um, but, yeah. but Gbots kind of out out sh out shown them. Um, but it's uh, it's something where this is just experience for them, and moving forward, they'll have they'll have some things to build on. All right, and just jumping back to Envious as well. So yes, a little bit of a political game is the reason they finished quite low. Yeah. Uh, however, fair to say they've had some struggles as well, right? I mean, Happy, Keo, MBK all finished below uh, one frag per round, one KDR. Uh, Kenny S played quite well, but overall they didn't have a great tournament. Is that the opponents they got put up against or, you know, what you're talking about, the political situation or just not a great event for them? Yeah, it, it certainly it certainly doesn't doesn't help the opponents they played against. I mean, they're one of the best in the world, so you can't put it all on that. Uh, yeah. But but certainly some of the other players and teams got some easier matches. You think the the Dignitas and Astralis 
Um, I mean, they were the first two teams to set up an alliance on the very first day, so you could see there was a section where they just juggled going up against G-Bot's existence, vexed. I mean, they just went back and forth with some easy matches. Uh, you know, Envy, on the other hand, they didn't they didn't form an alliance because G2, G2 told them no on the first day, so they didn't really get an alliance going until the end of the first day, start of the second day, and, I mean, they got pitted because the Danes controlled the, uh, the entire opponent selection for that first day. Uh, Envy was put into matches against... Fnatic against the best teams there, so definitely more stat padding on teams that were envious, um, and that that's kind of what you know that kind of what caused those low statistics. Well, uh, let's have a look at our next graphic, which is notable results. So uh, these are not in any particular order, definitely not chronological order. These are just four uh, particularly close games from the tournament, and uh, two things. Well, one thing we'll notice, I guess, is that two teams crop up in three matches here. So Fnatic and Astralis. Uh, both make three appearances and uh, Astralis in particular you know kind of had a rough ride this tournament they finished in second place but uh, if you look at these matches you know they lost to Fnatic 16-14 then 16-13 they got second place Jason but is it fair to say if just a couple of rounds had gone their way it could have been a very different tournament for them Absolutely. Uh, they definitely should have won that Dust2 match against Fnatic. Um, yeah. And I think I think they even had a, a pretty decent advantage on Inferno. Actually, they had a great advantage on Inferno. And they lost the second half to um, to a Force Buy and to just a full-blown Eco from Fnatic. So some some crucial mistakes in both those maps. I actually thought that this was uh, Astralis, despite these losses and getting second place and everything, I thought they looked better at this event against, you know, against top-tier competition than they have in some time. Um, so we saw, I think, a lot of improvements out of them. Um, but you still see that same tendency to kind of drop the ball in those high pressure spots. Uh, and it, it's, it's gotten to the point, and we've talked about it a bunch uh, as analysts and everything. Uh, it's gotten to the point where it almost seems like they know they're going to drop the ball at a certain point. So when it happens, like you, you just see it coming like a train. There's like mm -hmm. one, one round they lose, and then you're just like, all right, they're just going to slide uh, from here on out. Uh, and that's what, that's exactly what happened in both those matches against Fnatic. I mean, this is this is something that they they this is a tournament they should have won. Uh, well, one more one more thing we should talk about, obviously, before we move on from this topic, is uh, the perennial champions. It seems uh, Team Fnatic. It's so unreal. they won. Sorry, say again. It's unreal. Unreal. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, not only did they win this tournament, the streak's been continuing again. They're just back on top. Everybody's winning all the time. It's outrageous. They had three players in the top 10 of this tournament and uh, you know, every other team lost all three of their lives. Fnatic had two to spare at the end of the tournament, so they weren't even under any pressure. Flusher um, called that on day one, by the way. He said they were only going to lose one life the whole event. Oh, really? And, well, they, and, they, mean, and they lost it. I think they, they lost it on day one, didn't they? They did in their very yeah. first game, 10-16. Yeah. yeah, so, um, I mean, Walker Street, it's, it's phenomenal, right? These What these guys are doing at the moment. Yeah, it's... Um... I mean, Olaf continues to be this insane, insane player. Um, yep. Dennis with pistols was huge. Even on Ecos, when they have those pistols, you can't even, like, it's just, it's incredible. And, I mean, JW, as silly as it sounds, during during the post-tournament interview he did on stage, he was just like, we're fanatic, we win those rounds, and I'm JW. <laughs> and, like, he jumped around and knifed somebody in, in the grand finals, and he's like, I'm JW, that's what I do. Uh, it's just that the confidence is still just all time skyrocketed. Um, they got bogged out against Envy on Cobble, and they actually looked like they were just about to get routed. Uh, and that's when they have a guy like Olaf. And even like you, want, it's hard to ex it's so hard as analysts. I think we're all kind of frustrated, like with trying to explain why Fnatic is so good because sometimes it doesn't make sense. Uh, yep. And the thing that Olaf said is, is you know, we have five players on this team who can step up at any point and make that game changing performance. Uh, and that's exactly right. And that's once again what happened in this event was just when they needed it, one of those players stepped up. Whether it was JW on Dust2 just being, you know, a, a nuisance during their comeback. Whether it was Olaf on Cobble against Envy. Um, you know, Dennis had that big, he aced on an eco round. So everyone, everyone on that team is just uh, incredible form right now. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, good to see that ego isn't an issue for those guys, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm well, be with fanatic. That's how it goes. I love it. I mean, that's what that's what we all want teams <laughs> oh, yeah. to say. We want them to have that personality. We want them to have that cockiness to them. It's it's awesome to have it. Um, and I think actually, even NBK said said some things that were really really nice about them on Twitter that are completely true. Is that you know the way they play together as a team is just incredible. That's not matched by any other team in the world. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and the real amazement about it isn't these individual tournaments. It's that this has been going on now since like January of last year. Uh, or February of last year where they've just been yeah. the most dominant team and for it to extend this long is so incredible 
All right, well, congratulations to Fnatic. They did walk away with gold in the end. And that was ESL Barcelona from February 19th to 21st, understandably, in Barcelona, Spain. And before we jump over to story number two, let's check in with Miss Harvey to see what CS fact she's got for us this week. Thanks, Jack. In 2006, Valve released an update for Counter-Strike Source called Dynamic Weapon Pricing. Each Monday, every weapon in the game would change price depending on how popular it was the previous week. For example, if AKs had been very popular, then they would get more expensive. If Ops had been unpopular, then they would get cheaper. However, this quickly broke the game. Common weapons like the M4 spiked up to $5,000 and some SMGs dropped as low as $140. The Deagle was more expensive than the Alp and you could buy a Glock for just a dollar. After a few months of community rage, dynamic weapon pricing was removed from the game. Balance was restored and it was back to business for source players everywhere. Thank you very much, Steph. Jason. Does dynamic weapon pricing sound like a good idea whatsoever? Sounds god awful. Sounds like a failed experiment, and thank god. I agree. Let's move on. Now, our second story this week is DreamHack Malma, the North American qualifiers, uh, which had three spots up for grabs, three American teams uh, heading over to Sweden. Now, the qualifier was February 21st. There were 16 teams in total, eight invite invitees, and eight qualifiers. Uh, and this was just a straight elimination bracket, Jason. Best of three. So as we get this up on screen, uh, again, so we've got Cloud9, NRG, Tempo Storm, Optic, all the usual faces are here, apart from Renegades, I guess. They still stick out to me, that Australian team appearing in North American brackets. I'll yeah. never get used to that. Uh, however, let's start with Tempo Storm. So this is another big qualification for them, right? They uh, qualified for Katowice... Uh, what, a week ago, two weeks ago now? Yep. And they beat, so this particular tournament, they beat Echo Fox, Optic, Cloud9. They went all the way through, just won straight out, essentially. These guys are putting North Americans to shame. Correct, Jason? Uh, yeah. Yeah, they definitely are. I mean, don't forget that they also qualified for the for the, the, the last chance qualifier in North America as well. So, I mean, another sure. spot. They've taken They've taken a major qualifier spot, a Katowice spot, now a Malmo spot uh, from all these teams that, that uh, in North America. So, yeah. I mean, let's, you know, let's not talk too much about, or there has been plenty of talk about how they're they're just fastly becoming the better team and kind of putting all the North American excuses to bed. Um, they, they, I mean, these guys are playing so well. They're definitely one of the top teams in the region right now. Um, mm -hmm. You know, especially coming off, you can just see the influence that like Luminosity has had helping them improve um, and just the level they've gotten to once Bolts uh, came down from LG and joined their team. Uh, it's pretty incredible. Um, and definitely, uh, you know, you got to call them. Yeah, I, I think top five in North America is, is entirely fair to say they're, that they're there uh, in this region. And they're not in pro league, which is a little bit of a bummer. But I'm more interested to see where they're at on the international scale. And we'll have plenty of that now because they've been so dominant in our region, um, seeing them over the next few weeks. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I mean, at least three tournaments coming up that they'll be in, right? Yeah. Um, all right, well, the, another thing we should talk about is Team Liquid. Um, cause they were the other team that just qualified straight through, right? So as we look at the bracket, they beat Renegades 2-0 and then uh, CLG 2-0. Just, I mean, really had no issues in this bracket. Yeah. This was Liquid's first event with Kusta on the team. Uh, how do you think it went, Jason? Uh, couldn't have gone better. Uh, you know, I was, in, I was in Spain, so I didn't get to watch too much of it. I did, sure. I did uh, for whatever reason... You know, we'd had a couple drinks, tuned in at about 3 a.m. in Spain, uh, <laughs> in the middle of a nightclub in Barcelona, uh, just to see the, the end of some of that CLG match. Uh, didn't really need to. I was just, uh, I was just pumped. Um, yeah, but I mean, well, sorry, let me, so you're surrounded by these Spanish girls who you've professed love for, and yet you sit in a nightclub watching Counter-Strike, is what you're saying to me just now. Typical, just typ <laughs> typical day in the life, you know? All right, all right. <laughs> um, yeah. It's uh, all the all the reports. So everything I've heard out of out of Team Liquid about Kusta have been have been positive. That he's you know he stepped in very easily. Um, you know he's being assimilated very nicely. Uh, but this is just one of those things where yeah they, they did great at this and it's gonna be awesome to see him in Malmo. Um, but it just makes you a little bit bummed out that he's not gonna be with them for the major qualifier or for the major if they qualify for it. Um, so I'd have to go back to actually see how he did uh, in game and how they're using him. Um, but you know, guys, uh, he's he's a really good player. He's got a good good head on his shoulders, um, and he's I think he's someone who's we're going to see continue to improve very very rapidly in that lineup. 
Absolutely. And of course, the other thing we should say is that Tempo Storm and Team Liquid, they did qualify, but... They didn't play. Was... Say again, sorry? They didn't play each other. No, they didn't play each other, but as we look at the bracket, right, they didn't play one another, but they qualified for the tournament at the expense of Cloud9, who is the next team we should talk about. Yeah. So as, as we look at the graphic again, we'll see that third place decider over on the, on the far right. Um, and you're right, so Tempo Storm and Liquid did not play, they just qualified straight up and ended there, but there was this third place decider between the losers of those two games, Cloud9 versus CLG, and CLG took that as well. Uh, Cloud9 been getting a lot of stick recently, Jason. There was the whole Freakazoid thing and, you know, nothing's performance. The way they've been playing is just down in the dumps. Uh, what is going wrong? I've, I've asked this question so many times in so many different episodes of Pop Flash, but what is going wrong with Cloud9 this time? Uh, I mean, at this point, too, now it's it's starting, it's going to start getting to the point where they're so disorganized that it's just going to be getting in their, in their minds. Like, they, they'd probably know... Uh, you know, no matter what you say, like whatever Freakazoid says to pump this team up when they go into an important match, um, mm. you know, they've, they've just got to know that they've got to have this feeling, whether they admit it or not, in the back of their head, like, here we go again. Um, especially considering their T sides have been atrocious. So yeah. it's one of those things where you're on your CT side and you're like, oh, great, you know, we have 11 rounds right now. We should be able to close this one out, but, you know, we suck at T side. We, we should probably get 13 rounds. Um, you know, and, and nothing even came out, and this was incredible. Nothing came out on Twitter and said he's really struggling with in-game leading and he needs some assistance. Uh, yeah. and, and it's it's just kind of funny to – not funny, it's it's sad, but um, it's it's interesting to see that tweet when, you know, everyone from, from analysts, from the community, uh, we all seemed to know beforehand that they were going to have these kind of issues. Like this is something they should have taken care of in the offseason. Uh, I know yeah. they – and I know they went out and they tried. Uh, I know they tried to get Pronax. They tried to get Gabi. Um and it, and it didn't happen for whatever reasons, but like you can't just let that. You can't just say, "Oh, we didn't get our number one and number two options." All right, we'll just go into it without a coach or without an analyst, uh, without someone who's going to help us tactically, because uh, you're seeing the product of it now. Um, and yeah, they they just need more help. I mean, even the players who are in their roles, Freak as the entry, Stewie, you know, either next to or right behind them, Skidoo with Opping, you know, Shroud still doing his thing. All these all these roles that they they had so well defined last summer. Um, you know they're still well defined, but there's no production coming up from them, um, and and that's that's a huge issue. Like, and that's the thing when you have these defined roles, like when Freakazoid is just going to be a straight up 100% entry fragger, and he's not having production. Mm. Um, although he did have the he was the best C9 player, I think, or the second best behind Skadoodle he was at this yeah. event. But um, when, when that entry production isn't coming in, then everyone else's roles suffer because they have so much more work on their plate. Uh, so it, they're in a scary situation now. It's going to be really interesting to see how they adapt moving forward. Last but not least, I've got some quick fire questions for you, Jason. So, quick as you can, give me your thoughts on the following news stories from the week. Okay. Mo has ruled himself out of the major qualifier. Yeah, that is uh, due to him. You know, if he qualifies with Liquid, which for every everything that you look at with the groups says they should, uh, then he would not be able to go through the next minor circuit uh, with Echo Fox. Uh, okay. During during the next major major process, so uh, that's entirely what he's doing is just making sure he's available to his team. Um, I still think there's some confusion among teams. Like he could they could still go through the last chance qualifier, but in, in that situation they'd only have one chance to qualify versus two. Uh, yeah. It's also an online bracket, so um, just making sure that he's safe for his own team. Which by the way, I think this went a little bit unnoticed because I know I didn't even know this until I saw um, he's part of some esports business conference and on that on the on the sheet. Uh, where he's going to be on a panel, it lists him as like a co-owner of Echo Fox. Um, um, so I, I'm like, when you have that high of an investment into that team, uh, I don't know if that's just the CS division or, or how that all works out on a business standpoint. But obviously, when you're that high up in the team and you have that much investment into it, this is the right decision for him to make. It's just um, a little bit of a bummer for Liquid that that he agreed to it, and then a couple of days later he had to pull out. So they lost they lost time on trying to find someone to to bring in. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, as we alluded to earlier in the show, Liquid have officially completed their signing of Kusta. Yeah, I love it. I've been a, a big proponent, as it's well known, of Kusta for a long time now. Um, I've also been a proponent of him joining Team Liquid um, for a long time now, ever since they got Simple, basically. Even before that, I was hoping they would get Kusta, um, but mm. for someone like Simple, you can't really pass that up. Um, so, yeah, this is awesome. It's still just it's a little bit of like it's just such a weird situation now because he can't play with them at the major qualifier or the major 
So he's actually going to be playing with the old enemy squad who are not going as enemy because the org didn't extend their contracts after Kusta left. Um, yeah. So he's actually playing with them in the qualifier while Liquid plays in another group. So it's just a weird situation. And, and him actually competing with them in official matches and official events just can't come soon enough. That's it for this week. I'm Jack Westerman, joined by Jason Moses O'Toole. And we'll be back next Wednesday with another episode of Pop Flash.